Thanks very much, Naomi, and uh, welcome, everybody. So, you've heard about health and safety, now you're going to hear about death, okay? So, it's a nice sort of transition in a way, the inevitable. And what we're going to be speaking about tonight is a range of views about death and the afterlife that the Greeks had. And put very simply, it's kind of complex and sort of messy, uh, but in some ways for good reasons, because the Greeks didn't really have a canonical text like the Bible or a, or a Quran or a text that told them what they needed to believe. There was Greek religion and Greek thinking about the afterlife was an open system rather than a closed system. So we get a range of different sorts of views. And the two figures you see up here, this one here is Aeschylus, uh, the great tragic poet, um, the earliest playwright, certainly in the Western tradition to believe there's some complete examples of his work. One of the reasons why I put him up there is that, A, I think he's pretty fantastic, and B, um, he has given me the title uh, of um, the talk tonight, Alone of All the Gods, which is a quote that survives um, from one of his plays, and the rest of the line is, Alone of All the Gods, Death Takes No Gifts. That is to say, the Greeks had a habit of um, personifying and deifying so many phenomena, and whether it be the seasons, whether it be death, whether it be the natural environment, the sea, the mountains, whatever. Um, and so they made death a god. Now they called him Thanatos, or he could be Hades, he could take a number of different names. But one of the points that Aeschylus makes, and it's a pretty powerful point in many ways, is that once you're gone, you're gone. Death can't be bought. You can't buy back what, you've, what has been killed, what has been taken away from you. Uh, and this, in some ways, goes against the grain of lots of other aspects of Greek Olympian religion, which, put very simply, tends to be a bit of a quid pro quo uh, setup. That is to say, you make a dedication to a god, and you hope that that god will be kind to you, or goddess will be kind to you, and give you something in return. It doesn't really work with death. And he says this in this great play called The Frogs, by Aristophanes, the comic poet, which, as you can tell from its title, is all about the nature of poetry. Okay? The Frogs is set in the underworld. And it's the original Dead Poet Society. Aeschylus has died. He's been dead for about 50 years on the play set. Euripides has just died. And they're having a punch-up with each other to see who can be the best poet. Who is a poet that Dionysus, the god of poetry, and a god strongly associated with the dead, who also appears here, is going to bring back to Athens um, in the late stage of a long and disastrous war that the Athenians had with the Spartans called the Peloponnesian War. The idea being, you bring back a poet and he's going to inculcate the right virtues and the right sort of civic identity that the community needs in order to win. Does anybody know who, who wins? Which one he takes back? Any spoilers? Oh, okay. Uh, maybe you do. Well, I'll let the rest of you read it. But at one point, Aeschylus, there's a competition. So you can produce the weightiest line. And uh, they speak into these scales. And Aeschylus says at one point, alone of all the gods, death takes no gifts. And the scales go down. And he beats Euripides, and Euripides says, how can he do that? And Dionysus says, he spoke about death. You can't get heavier than death, can you? <laughs> okay? So on that note, I'll be speaking about this figure, Hades. Hades, uh, the god of the dead, the god of the underworld. The name also is associated with his realm. Uh, he, it, it connotes not only the name of the god, but also his, uh, his kingdom. And he was one of the three brothers, along with um, Zeus and Poseidon, who carved up the universe amongst the three of them. Zeus probably got the best gig, he got the sky and the upper air. Poseidon got the sea and the surface of the earth. That's why he's the god of earthquakes as well as the violent sea. And Hades got uh, the underworld and some probably, you know, kind of a bit of a bum steer in a way. And he finds it hard to get a girlfriend, but he has a way of getting around it, uh, as, as we'll see. Now, he is the god of the dead, but he's not really to be conflated with uh, a satanic figure. He's not really evil, he's not malicious, but he's just rather grim and relentless. And so when you die, that's it, and you can't really turn back. There is one story that I'll talk about briefly, which does tell of a figure who's able to persuade Hades and uh, Persephone uh, to bring back someone to life uh, that has been lost. And in some ways, he, he has the aspects of what you might call, what the Greek called a chthonic deity. The word chthon means the earth, and Hades was a god who lived in the earth and under the earth. And this is going to be very important in terms of his identity because he wasn't always seen as a god of, of destruction and the end of life. Paradoxically, good things come up out of the earth. The earth is a source of fertility in the soil, of course, and this is why he gets known as the enricher. Hades, paradoxically, uh, becomes, if not exactly a fertility god, 
it gets associated with the idea of renewal coming up through the earth. And this is why it's called Pluto. Uh, and of course, that gives you the name Pluto, which is what uh, the Romans called them. It means the enricher. Okay. Now, here's the husband of uh, Persephone. Okay. And you've got this wonderful statue by uh, Bernini, uh, which refers to him as Pluto and refers to her as a Proserpina. The Romans also called him Dis, which is uh, related to the Latin word Dewey's. Again, the Latin word for wealth. So he's actually a god of wealth. Uh, good things come up out of the earth. The earth is a source, as I say, for fertility, for growing crops and vegetables and so on. Also, it's a place where there are precious metals, there's stone, things that you can use for, for building uh, and so on. Also, he's rich because his kingdom is always grown because people are always dying. Okay? So this is one of the reasons why he's seen as having this sort of expansive sort of empire. Now, I'll come to the story of uh, Persephone and Hades uh, in just a few moments. But uh, one thing that is worth thinking about in terms of some of the ideas we get about Hades that are going to be very influential come from the figure of uh, Homer, uh, the great poet. Uh, he may be the greatest poet who never lived because we don't know anything about him, but he is the name under which the epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, have come down to us. And he had a great uh, exalted status in Greek uh, culture. Uh, he was sort of seen as the Fonz at Origo, the sort of the source and the origin for their, their culture and their learning on so many levels. But he was openly criticised too by many figures, including people like the Platonic Socrates and other philosophers as well. But he does shape a lot of ideas about uh, the afterlife uh, for the Greeks, uh, and also indirectly Christian ideas about the afterlife uh, as well. Uh, and in my episode, which I'll speak about, there is a, an important moment when Odysseus, uh, the great hero of the Odyssey, travels down to the underworld as he's coming home from Troy and he meets some of his old army buddies, including Achilles and Ajax and Agamemnon. And Achilles famously says that he'd rather be a slave to a farmer who's poor and miserable than lord of all the dead. Uh, and why that matters so much, uh, coming from Achilles especially, is something that I'll, I'll speak about a little bit later. Anyway, Homer gives us some kind of uh, idea of the sort of things you'd expect to find when you go to the underworld. So, uh, th these are some of the things that um, you'd expect to see. The river of fire, the river Phlegathone, uh, which travels around this way as well. There's Tartarus, which is the deepest pit of the underworld, which is sort of like constantly windy and horrible. And this is where really bad figures go, like the Titan that Zeus beats up. Uh, this is the Palace of Hades there. Of course, this is all an imaginary construction, really. It's not really like this. There's the river of Lethe, which means the river of forgetfulness. There's also the river of Styx, which means the river of hate. Uh, and there are also uh, the Elysian Fields, which is where the good people go. Okay? Who's been to the Champs-Élysées in Paris? Well, you've been to the Elysian Fields. That's what it means. Okay? So this is where people... There is a, a concept of having a blessed afterlife, if you're lucky, but that's pretty rare. For the most part, what we get from home is that the underworld is just kind of dead boring. It's not a place of endless torture. It's kind of like... I don't know, 1950 suburban London um, on a Sunday afternoon in the middle of winter, all the time. It's just dead boring, okay? We do get a couple of figures who are famously punished in the underworld for their transgressions, uh, including this figure, Tantalus, who uh, does something terrible. He invites the gods around to dinner, and then he does what any loving host would do. That is, he decides to kill his son, called Pelops, chop him up and make a Pelops stew and give that to the gods. Needless to say, the gods get pretty off about this and so they decide to punish him and they kind of give him a homeopathic remedy because he's very bad at uh, serving dinner and being a host they punish him by giving him a, a, a hunger that can't be satisfied and a thirst that can't be slaked uh, but they surround him with beautiful drinking water and fruits and vegetables that always disappear every time he goes to the witches for them so he is forever tantalised uh, a lot of the uh, Titius is a giant who uh, tried to rape Hera and he's punished in the underworld. Uh, he's sort of stretched out and, um, on the ground uh, in sort of a cruciform shape. Sisyphus is a famous trickster uh, who actually tricks death and plays uh, one of the personifications of death in one of his stories. And he actually goes back up to the, um, uh, the world of the living to escape and then he's punished again. And he does really die the second time. And his punishment is rolling a stone up a hill. And just as he's about to get to the top, it rolls down to the bottom again. So again, he's in this sort of eternal cycle of frustration. And then there are the Danaeids, these women, 49 of whom, um, of the 50 daughters of Danaeids, kill their husband on their wedding night of the orders of their father because he hears a um, prophecy that one of his son-in-laws is going to kill him. And 49 of them do this, and then they're punished. And their punishment sounds pretty harmless. They're just told to fill a pitcher of water and take it from one place to the next. 
the fine print is the picture has no bottom in it. And they have to fill it up first before they can move. So the kind of punishments that you get in the underworld aren't going to be sort of hellfire and brimstone punishments. They tend to be often punishments of frustration, sort of things that can drive you mad. Uh, and this is a, an image from the 4th century BC. Uh, we see Heracles, the great hero, one of his, his final ways was to get the three-headed dog Cerberus from uh, the underworld. There we see Hermes, a bit more about him in a moment, uh, with his caduceus, his wand. Uh, and there we can see uh, the figure of Sisyphus, uh, pushing up uh, the rock up the hill while being flogged by this figure over here is called a fury or an enemy, it's a figure of revenge. So Hades then is famous for abducting um, Persephone, who is the daughter of Demeter, uh, a place called Eleusis, which is just round, sort of northwest of Athens. And here is the famous cave where the abduction is supposed to have taken place. Um, I took a couple of photos there a couple of years ago and couldn't find any direct evidence, but there it is. <laughs> There's the sign there saying Pluto was here. So look out. <laughs> Persephone in the underworld is abducted, and this is an important myth that is told um, in a great hymn called The American to Demeter, and in many ways it's sort of seen as a rite of passage. She's a young virgin goddess, the daughter of Demeter. She's out with, the, with her girlfriends picking flowers, and then the earth opens up, and out comes uh, Hades, who can't get a girlfriend, so he decides to broker a deal with his brother and say, uh, can I get your daughter? And Zeus says, okay. And in some ways, this reflects uh, the idea of an arranged marriage in a sort of a patriarchal, archaic state. It tended to be a deal broker between the two fathers, saying, okay, my son will marry your daughter, and it's going to be good for business reasons. So this is what happens to her, and she's not happy about this, and her mother Demeter uh, goes looking for her, and Demeter is the goddess of the crops, she's the goddess of fertility, and this is a link to Hades in fertility, and she goes on strike while her daughter is missing. And while she's on strike, there are no crops, which means animals can't be fed, which means there can't be sacrifices to the gods, and the gods are getting a bit sort of pissed off about this. So they try to persuade her to uh, come back uh, to manage with us, but she won't, and she goes wandering the earth uh, for a long time. What happens to Persephone, though, while she's in the underworld, is that she's tripped by Hades. And in an instance where you have uh, fruit coming in as a kind of a sexual metaphor, she actually eats uh, a pomegranate seed that Hades has uh, tricked her into eating. And it's an obvious sort of metaphor of a male putting a seed into a female so that she becomes his wife. And because of that, she has to stay down in the underworld for one third of the year, for four months of the year. She's able to stay out, uh, hang out with her mum for the other eight months. So what it means then is that when she uh, takes the pomegranate, this is like accepting her new role as a consort of, of the Lord of the Dead. And it's a pretty straightforward metaphor, as I say, for sort of sexual uh, activity or sexual rightness. And when I show you some uh, statues, like these Korai statues, statues of young maidens, quite often they will be holding a pomegranate in their hand. So these are young aristocratic women on the, the cusp of um, uh, becoming sexually active, becoming mothers. Again, in the uh, patriarchal world of um, archaic Greece, nice Greek girls would only have sex with nice Greek boys only after they got married and only to produce legitimate, you know, hopefully male heirs mostly, okay? So, uh, this idea then of uh, her eating the pomegranate seed means that she's accepted her role as his consort. And so she's got to stay down there in the underworld for um, four months of the year. And this leads to the change of the seasons. In the cave period, the Greeks kind of really imagined three seasons. They didn't really have an autumn. Autumn is a bit of a long season when you think about it. But this is the original, as Bob Dylan fans will tell you, her subterranean home of Williams <laughs> in the underworld. Okay? Thank you, Naomi. She's in the underworld missing her mum. Okay? Now, she gets, she's able to be restored by Hermes, again, once the brothers broke her a deal. And she's able to come up for eight months of the year, and she's escorted in the, up, up from the underworld by Hermes in his role as a figure known as Psychopompus. Hermes is a messenger god, he's a god of change and transition, and Psychopompus means uh, conveyor of souls. Hermes is a god of change and uh, luck, uh, he's a god of transactions, and he's the god that's going to preside over us when we undergo the biggest change of all, which is when we die. He's the one in the Greek imagination that's going to take us down uh, to the underworld. So. Hermes, then, is an important figure in the whole role of, of death as well. Even though he's not explicitly a, a, a god of the dead, he does have this liminal role where he can go down to the underworld to take souls down to the underworld and also bring them up in the case of uh, Persephone, who's actually a, uh, a goddess, of course. Now, Persephone has another interesting role uh, linked to death uh, in a different kind of tradition. What we have is a series of poems from um, 
go back originally to the Archaic period, which is about 500 BC or earlier, poems that were ascribed to the figure of Orpheus, the famous musician. And Orpheus was this famous, the world's greatest musician who went down to the underworld and was able to persuade Hades and Persephone to bring back his beloved Eurydice, who'd been bitten by a snake and died. The power of his music was so strong that he moved these gods to say, yes, you can bring her back on one condition. That is, you walk back to the upper world and don't look back until uh, she's with you, until you've got back to the upper world. What does he do? He looks back with one step to go and he loses her forever. Okay. But the idea was that people of Orpheus had these sort of special powers. And there were these poems that were ascribed to the figure of Orpheus, telling of the origins of the universe. And what you've got were these strange figures called Phanes, Protagonos, and Nyx, which means night. Protagonos means firstborn, Phanes means the one who appears. What is interesting about this early cosmogony, this early ge genealogy of the origins of the universe, is that it's quite different from what you get in the conventional Olympian account, the account that you get, say, in Hesiod. Zeus and Dionysus appear, but they're, they're quite late in this Orphic tradition. But what happens is Dionysus is the son of Zeus and Persephone in this account. And we hear of a rather terrible story whereby Hera, the endlessly spiteful wife of Zeus, pretty long suffering too, I suppose, she doesn't like Dionysus because he's the son of um, uh, Persephone, not her. So he's a little baby and she gets him to play with these toys in front of the Titans, who are these monstrous figures who... Uh, existed before the Olympians, and they tear him apart and they eat him. And then Zeus, in his anger, blasts them with a thunderbolt. Fortunately, he grabs the heart of little Dionysus, puts it back in his thigh, and nine Olympian months later, there's Dionysus popping up out of there. But this became an important psychological myth for the Greeks because they said, what this tells us then is that what Zeus has done with the ashes of the Titans is he makes human beings out of them. We, and so we are part Titanic, we are part Dionysian, we are part monstrous, and we are part divine. So it becomes an important kind of allegory for the human condition in many ways. And Heraclitus, the philosopher, also tells us that Dionysus, who often and rightly is considered a god of, sort of instinctive life and emotion and drinking wine and this sort of thing, is also a god intimately associated with death. He actually says that Hades and Dionysus are, are one. And this leads me on to uh, this group of figures called the Satyrs, who are his friends. And in Achaic and classical Greek art and literature, they are part equine. Uh, they've got these ass ears, they've got these big tails. We have a splendid Attic Amphora in the Loki collection, not on display at the moment, but a splendid Attic Amphora for about 540 BC of the return of Hephaestus. Um, he's coming back to Olympus after being made drunk by Dionysus because his mum had thrown him out when he was a kid and uh, eventually they got reconciled, but that's another story. There is Dionysus, and these two guys here are the satyrs. Uh, again, the, you can see the horses' tails they have there. Now, they are often sort of seen as lecherous and buffoonish and silly and cowardly, but because they're the friends of Dionysus, they also have this sort of paradoxical wisdom about them as well, and they are divine beings. And there is a story concerning Silenus, who is the father of the satyrs, and the foster father of Dionysus. And this got the great image by Rubens of this pot-bellied, boozy Silenus. He's captured by Midas. This is Midas who has the, the golden touch. He sees Silenus and he says, listen, you're a god. You are an intimate of, of Dionysus. Tell us what is the best thing for human life. How can human beings be happy? What's the secret to success? Secret to happiness? And uh, Silenus says, you don't want to know. Be careful what you ask for. You don't want to know. And he says, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Eventually, he says, okay, well, you ask for it. And the best thing for mortals is this. And get ready for yourself. Pretty gloomy stuff, eh? Okay. Um, so, and this is linked to Dionysus uh, in his role as a god of tragedy. Dionysus is a god of destruction. So the best thing will never to have been born or to die uh, as, soon as, as soon as possible. Pretty miserable stuff. But um, there is actually, a, I'm told, a, a, a Jewish kind of response to this. So yes, that might be true, but have you ever met anyone who's been so lucky? Yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> This is also linked to uh, a quote that is attributed to none other than Homer himself. There was this fictitious competition that the Greeks had between Homer and another pope called Hesiod. They always wanted to face off against each other. And at one point, Hesiod says, OK, Mr. Smarty Pants, you're supposed to be this great poet. What is the best thing for mortals? And Homer says pretty much the same thing as Silenus. Firstly, the best thing for mortals is not to have been born, but once born, to pass through the gates of Hades as quickly as possible. However, th then he says, because Hesiod asks him the question again, he said, but don't worry, 
Another really great thing that mortals can do is go out, get your rocks off, drink lots of booze, and listen to a poet like me in a convivial setting. So maybe it's a case where second price is, is better than first price. Okay? <laughs> the point, though, is that you're getting these different attitudes to death and coming from quite surprising sources. The sat is often seen as silly and buffoonish and hedonistic, but they have this profound insight into the human condition. And the satyrs were also linked to this figure Socrates, uh, as you can see here. Uh, easy to get it mixed up. You can see the, uh, mm -hmm. the resemblance between the two of them because of their wisdom, this sort of paradoxical wisdom they had, and also their playfulness and their kind of irony as well. And Socrates brings us on to another figure who has important theories of the afterlife, which is the philosopher Plato. And Plato was Socrates' most famous student, one of the most influential and important philosophers who ever lived. A brilliant literary artist, full of great wit and uh, rich character portrayal in his dialogues. And at the end of his most influential work, a work called The Republic, which is all about how to lead a just life and what is the purpose of being just. And the argument very, very how do you summarise the Republic in one sentence? The argument very simply is that being just is in your own interest. Why? Because he has this theory of reincarnation. And what he does is he expounds this myth of uh, reincarnation at the end of the Republic by telling the story of a figure called Air, who is an Anatolian warrior, who has a near-death experience. And he seems to be dead for 10 days, but his soul goes to the, the next world. Then he come, it comes back into his body and then he says, guys, I've got an amazing thing to tell you about what happens to us when we die. And what happens is we go to a place of either punishment or rewards based on the life we've had for a thousand years. At the end of this 1,000 year cycle, we go back to where we came from and there we are confronted with the choice about what kind of life we're going to lead when we come back. The reason why we can't uh, remember our previous lives is before we come back to Earth, we drink from the cup of the river of Alethi, which means oblivion. That's why we can't remember any of these things. So what happens is we get this interesting mix of reincarnation based on choices that are made by people who've led either a good life or a bad life. And the choices are set up for us by the fates who scatter various lives at our feet and we decide on the basis of what lands at our feet what kind of life we're going to lead. So one example is, and Plato says, he looks at Homeric heroes like um, Ajax and Agamemnon and he says their stories are so miserable. Uh, they suffered so much on earth that they decided to be reincarnated as animals. Uh, Agamemnon became an eagle, Ajax became a lion. The person who makes the best choice is Odysseus, who chooses the life of an ordinary person. And so there's an interesting kind of mix of randomness, because the fates scatter these lives in front of us, but we can still choose from what lands at our feet. And the kind of choice that you make will be determined by the kind of life that you led previously. So tyrants are always making bad choices. They're going to come back as tyrants, because they think, oh, I've got wealth and power and everything else. And we can think of some modern-day tyrants, but, you know... Don't have to think too far uh, to think of uh, people who are kind of hedonistic, self-obsessed, narcissistic, you know, lunatics, who are going to come back again and again and again, like that form. But a philosopher, if you lead a good life, this will mean that you will be rewarded in the next life, and when you get reincarnated, you're more likely to lead a good life again because you make a good, sound, philosophical choice. So this also, in some ways, is a variation on this uh, idea of what's called metempsychosis, or transmigrations of souls, that you're getting amongst the Pythagoreans as well. The idea that when we die, our soul can sometimes go into either another person or even an animal. And there's a story about Pythagoras getting angry when he sees somebody kicking a dog. He says, hey, you're actually kicking my best friend there, so I just back off and leave him alone, okay? So you are getting this belief in, of reincarnation uh, in Greek society as well. Now, as for the word for soul, it, it is linked to this idea of breath, Sukeo is the Greek word to breathe, and it's also related to the, um, the, the Romans have a similar kind of concept as well. The word spirit comes from the word spiro, which means to breathe. When you are inspired, somebody's breathing something into you. Uh, the word animus, which can mean, again, spirit or energy or force, if you like, comes from the Greek word anemos, which means wind. And the Greeks also call the soul an idol one, meaning uh, an image. So the soul can sometimes be seen as a kind of a shadowy counterpart to a person as well. So you're getting, you're getting lots of different ideas about what the soul means and what happens to us after we die. And one of the things that is important in, in terms of looking at these traditions about how we die comes to us from archaeological evidence and evidence from the poets as well. So after looking at some sort of religious and cultic ideas about what happens to us after we die, I want to talk a little bit about uh, 
especially Homeric concepts of death and what the idea of heroic death meant as well. Anybody who's been to Mycenae in the Peloponnese uh, would remember these uh, great tombs, these tholos tombs as they're called, beehive tombs, uh, built into a uh, side of a hill with a mound placed on top of them as well. And you've got this long runway, about 40 metres or so, uh, into this, this chamber. And from a very early stage, there was a belief that heroes uh, would still inhabit, their spirit would still inhabit places where they died, and they needed to be placated. Being a hero for the Greeks didn't necessarily mean you were a good guy. Uh, often you're quite angry, and they had also anger management problems, and they needed to have sacrifices made to them and offerings made to them so that it wouldn't harm uh, those who were still living. So what we do get, though, is these sacrifices testify to uh, belief in the afterlife and the idea that heroes can still affect those uh, who are living because their soul needs to be placated. One thing that we get from Homer is Patroclus, who is, is he the cousin of Achilles or just his best friend? Best friend, so they're just besties. Best friend. They're just besties, okay? They become lovers in tragedy and in Plato. You know, Homer he just makes them besties, right? Not cousins, that's for sure. Anyway, um, Patroclus, his ghost visits Achilles in a dream and tells him that he needs to be properly buried, he needs to be cremated, otherwise his soul just wanders about aimlessly. Once you're properly buried and cremated, then you can go down to the underworld and find some sort of peace. We also get a similar story about um, uh, Achilles, this time his ghost, uh, demanding the sacrifice of Polyxena, who is a Trojan princess. So even after he's dead, he's still killing Trojans. And the cults are maintained uh, yeah, to these heroes uh, throughout antiquity uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so the idea of being a hero and a heroic death is going to be another important strand in responses to death and the afterlife for the Greeks. One of the most important and influential of all these stories and the idea of heroic death is Hector, the Trojan prince, the great defender of Troy. And his story, his farewell, uh, to his wife Andromache, of course, is one of the most famous, one of the most moving uh, pieces of, of literature uh, in the world, in my view. Very famous in antiquity, uh, depicted widely in Greek art. I can show you plenty more where these came from. Also, very widely depicted in subsequent uh, Western art as well. It's a really kind of iconic moment when Hector is explaining to Andromache why he is fighting uh, for his people. Because she makes a very powerful and, and very moving case herself. And it's the kind of discussion that couples have had. You can imagine for millennia, the man saying, I've got to do what I've got to do. And she's saying, you have responsibilities to me and your child. Don't throw your life away being a tough guy. You can't do this because you are everything to me now. And she explains that Achilles has destroyed her entire family. And she actually says to Hector, you are my husband. You are my father. You are my mother. You are my brother. You are everything to me. And in a world where there's no welfare state, if he dies, her life is completely shot, completely destroyed. Hector says to her, everything you've said, I understand and I accept. I, I agree. I fully understand where you're coming from. Then he says, but there's something else. And he gives this speech about his own need for kleos. And he says, I can't be seen to be a coward and not fight with my people. Because she says, fight from inside the walls and send your people out to fight the Greeks. And he says, I can't do that. And so this is kind of classic dilemma that goes on. So uh, it's a sort of famously iconic moment. When Hector is made to explain uh, the reasons for his, his fighting. And I'll just read what he says to her uh, after she makes her passionate speech in public, which is a very brave thing to do because he's the great warrior, and she kind of dresses him down in the middle of uh, uh, the public on the battlements. And, she, and his response is, All these things are in my mind also, lady, yet I would feel deep shame before the Trojans and the Trojan women with trailing garments if, like a coward, I were to shrink aside from the fighting. And the spirit will not let me, since I've learned to be valiant, to fight always among the foremost ranks of the Trojans, winning for myself great glory, this important word, kleos, I'll come back to, and for my father. For I know this thing well in my heart, and my mind knows it. There will come a day when sacred Ilion shall perish, and Priam, and the people of Priam with the strong ash spear. So what he's saying is, we're going to lose. I'm going to die. You're going to get taken away as a slave. The only thing I've got to motivate me to fight is the fact that I've got this kleos, this glory that will live on after. That's the only compensation I've got. And then he goes on to say that while he would be distressed to learn of the death of his father and his brothers and his mother and so on, uh, it would tear him apart. He, hopes, he says, I hope I'm dead and buried before they take you away. Um, and then he says, and there will come a time when you are dragged off as a slave in some Greek town and people will point to you and say, 
There is the wife of Hector, who was ever the greatest of the Trojans, and he can't save her now. And so he looks into the horror that's, that's going to come to them. The only thing that he can see to compensate himself is, at least I'll go down in a blaze of glory. And it's sort of cold comfort for her. And then you get this moment, of course, where do you go from there? He said, we're going to lose. I can't save you. We can't win. This is all of it. And I know you're going to be dragged away to live your life as a sex slave to men who hate you, the men who killed me and destroyed your city. This is what he tells her. He doesn't say it with any glee. Of course, he, he says it with great pity. But where do you go from there? So what does he do? He does what, what a lot of people do. He sort of snap out of it and thinks, and he grabs his son, Astyanax, and he says, I hope my boy grows up to be a greater warrior than I am. And I hope he comes back from the battlefield covered in blood and guts and gives you glory, mum, because he's my boy and I want everything to be fine. That's what you sort of do. It's quite a human response. But when he reaches out for him, his helmet terrifies his son and his son starts crying. And what do they do? They start laughing. They, it's it's this, this strange moment. And there's a lovely description of Andromache smiling through her tears after she's heard what Hector has said. So they just try to snap out of it. And this is a very kind of human response. So you've got this sort of famous moment again where he's playing with his son, having announced that he can't win, they, that the war is, is going to be lost, that he still has these blind hopes that his son is going to be better than he is. I don't know how that got there, but anyway. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll, yes, yes, see you. I know that, yeah, I won't go there, I won't go there. However, so you get Hector talking about the importance of Kletos as something that gives him some sort of compensation. That's all he can, can hope for after he's gone. However, and this is one of the great things about the Iliad, it's not a mindlessly gung-ho epic. It's not just a man's got to do what a man's got to do. We have the great man himself, the terrifying man Achilles, basically dissing on Kletos altogether. Why? Because in the first book of the Iliad, you have the greatest warrior and the leader of the expedition ready to kill each other in the first couple of hundred lines. Because Agamemnon has been a pride dork in so many ways, decides to abduct Achilles' spear bride, his girlfriend, because he has to give away his own spear bride because he's insulted the priest of Apollo and it's his daughter that uh, he has abducted. And Achilles says, give the girl back, we'll get you another one. And Agamemnon says, well, if I'm going to go with that uh, spear bride, I think I'll take yours, Achilles. And Achilles goes on strike. And he says some great things in the first book. He actually calls the whole war into question and he says, Look, guys, why are we here anyway? We're just here because of him and his idiot brother. The Trojans are our enemies. They've never invaded my lands or stolen my cattle. What are we actually doing here? And he goes on strike. And, he, and nine books later, when the Greeks start losing, and he does spit the dummy big time and praise that the Greeks are losing his absence, they send an embassy to him with Odysseus, Ajax, and Phoenix, the three Greeks that he loves the most. And Odysseus makes a long, passionate speech to Achilles saying, look, we are suffering, we need you, your friends are dying, and you know, you've got to come back for the sake of friendship. Oh, and by the way, Agamemnon promises he's, he's going to give you all this stuff too if you come back. And then Achilles says, OK, I'm going to tell it like it is. Um, and he gives a long speech saying how much he hates Agamemnon and why he's not going to fight. But he also says something else that's really interesting. He says, again, this is the greatest warrior who lives the dream as the, the heroic warrior who's got his clout. So he says this, this is why he's not going to fight. A man's life cannot come back again. It cannot be lifted nor captured again by force once it has crossed the teeth's barrier. For my mother Thetis, the goddess of the silver feet, tells me I carry two sorts of destiny toward the day of my death. Either if I stay here and fight beside the city of the Trojans, my return, my nostos, is gone. But my glory shall be everlasting, Kleos Athleton. So I stay here and fight, I don't return, but I get Kleos. But if I return to the beloved land of my fathers, the excellence of my glory, my Kleos, is gone, but there will be a long life for me, and my end will not come to me quickly. And this would be my counsel to others also, to sail back home again, since no longer shall you find any term set on the sheer city of Ilion, since Zeus from the white brows has strongly held his hand over it, and its people were made bold. So what he's saying is, I've got a choice. Kleos, glory, or Nostos, return. And he says, stuff it, I'm going to go for Nostos. And this is the great warrior, okay? He renounces Kleos, the, the kind of heroic code that has been upheld a lot throughout the Iliad. And this is why it's such a great epic. It questions the heroic code, it shows that it's problematic and really complex. And Achilles is ready to chuck it out altogether. Another figure who is important, who also has views on the heroic code, is this figure, Sarpedon, who dies. And he explains to one of his allies as they're going into battle the concept of noblesse oblige. And he actually says, why are we honoured by our people? Why do we get the best meals at festivals and get the best lands and the best houses and everything? It's because we put our lives on the line for battle. And this is why we have to do this. So we get all these perks for it, 
but we've got to be ready to die for it if necessary. But he says something very interesting. He says, but listen, if you and I were immortal, we wouldn't do it. There'd be no point. Fighting for its own sake isn't any pleasure. It doesn't give you any joy. The only reason why we do it is that we know we're going to die. So he may as well go down in a blaze of glory and get what he calls eukos or praise. So again, you're getting this idea from Sarpedon that eukos or praise is a compensation for death on the battlefield. Okay? So we've had Achilles say, no, Kleos, not interested. I'm going to go home. And of course, he doesn't go home. He ends up doing this and charging at Hector after Hector kills his best mate, Patroclus. And it's one of the iconic moments of the Iliad when Achilles charges at Hector with a bit of support from Athena, just as Apollo has been helping uh, Hector. Uh, and on this uh, great um, vase by the Berlin painter, Hector's moving in for the kill. And we can see Apollo saying, bye bye Hector, your time's up, mate, because Zeus has already weighed the two souls. And the soul of Hector goes down to the ground, meaning he's going to die. So Achilles moves in for the kill. And he slaughters Hector, and then he very uh, infamously, of course, ends up, after chasing him around Troy, he ends up dragging his body around. But before then, Hector says something, after he realises that he can't defeat Achilles, he goes charging through his death, and he says, let me not die without an effort, without Kleos, uh, Kleos, but achieving something so great that future men will hear of it. So th again, this is his only compensation. Because even his mother and his dad saying, come inside, Hector, you can't beat this guy. Come inside. And Hector's in a dilemma. Says, what do I do? What do I do? You know, I can't be a coward. Or what do I do? I throw my life away. And of course, he gets defeated by uh, Achilles, who then, of course, infamously, and of course, this is an iconic moment in Western art where Rubens' version and so many other versions, then he drags his corpse uh, in front of his parents and abuses the corpse for days and days and days and deprives him of a proper burial and becomes a bad guy in uh, just about everybody's books, really. So this is going to be. Um, an important theme in the Iliad as well. Hector's body being dragged and the body being mutilated and the soul not being able to go down to the underworld. Uh, eventually, of course, Achilles does give back the body and in the wonderful poetry of Book 24, he is reconciled uh, in a way with Priam. They don't sort of kiss each other and say, oh, you know, I love you, you're my best mate or anything like that. There's no sense of salvation, but there is a sense of mutual pity that they have for each other because they both realise nobody wins this war. And Achilles actually says, my friend's not going to come back. Your son's not going to come back. But you can have your son's body back. And sooner there will be yet more misery for you as well. I don't know, I'm going to die as well. Because he's made the choice that if he avenges Patroclus and kills Hector, his mother and the goddess has said, you're going to die afterwards as well. And he says, well, I'm prepared to do that because I can't let my friend be unavenged. So literally all in tears. Achilles doesn't die at the end of the Iliad, but of course Hector's dead. And it finishes with Hector's burial. There's no wooden horse. We don't need a wooden horse in the Iliad. It ends beautifully and so movingly with the burial of Hector and with the women especially um, speaking about Hector and what, a, what a, a great guy he was in so many ways. And I think Helen makes the most moving speech of all about Hector. Helen who's come to Troy and in some ways is seen as the, the cause of the war. That's the Iliad, or part of the Iliad, just scratching the surface there. But we get another take on the whole idea of glory and honour. When Odysseus, the great hero who invents the wooden horse and is sailing back home, has to go down to the underworld to find directions. And he consults a figure called Tiresias, okay, uh, who's the, an ancient GPS figure, who is going to give him instructions. He's a prophet. He's going to give him instructions on how to get home. And he has a conversation with his dead friend, uh, Achilles. And he talks about how the Greeks honoured him and worshipped him as a god and his kleos will be ever everlasting. And this is what Achilles said, shooting from the hip as usual. Oh, brilliant Odysseus, never try to console me for dying. I'd rather, plow the uh, I'd rather follow the plough as slave to a man with no land allotted to him and not much to live on than be king over all the dead. So again, it seems to be a rejection of kleos. Dying has no compensation. Kleos has no compensation for Achilles, it seems. I want to talk just uh, a little bit now, just to, in the last uh, bit of this talk, about actual statues, and then um, Terry will um, be conducting some tours of the Tees Museum. And I'll finish up by speaking about one of the items we have in the Tees Museum. And I want to talk about statues to the dead and what they say about Greek attitudes to the dead uh, as well. You see this figure here, uh, known as the Anabasis Kuros. Anabasis is a region in Attica of about 530 BC. Uh, his name is Croesus, which is a, a Lydian name. It's a non-Greek name. And he is a large, big, barrel-chested, beefy-looking guy. He's about six foot five inches tall. 
way taller than anybody would have been in the ancient world. It's, it's even big and beefy now, but for somebody in the ancient world who had been considered six feet tall is unusually tall, this guy is kind of gigantic. And what is interesting about him is that there's a, uh, an inscription attached to him that uses the same meter as Homer. And this is what the inscription says. It says, Stay and have pity by the monument of the dead man Croesus, whom once in the front of, of, of battle raging RAs destroyed. What we get here then is this very poetic way of talking about the man's death. We're not told that he's killed by a particular individual, but raging RA is the war god. And it's in the same heroic meter as the Iliad. It's not a quote from the Iliad, but it's heroising the figure of this uh, figure, um, Croesus. It's kind of heroising him after he's died. He wouldn't have looked anything like this, of course. This, again, is a very idealised and prescriptive image. He died in battle. He would have died wearing armour. They didn't go into the battle nude, okay? So forget about 300, okay? This is what he uh, is going to be imagined to be like by his family who are going to be paying for the statue. It's going to be very much idealised, heroised, mythologized kind of version uh, of uh, what he's like. I want to talk about, just very briefly, some ancient poetry that can shed a bit of light about how people would respond to him as well. And what's interesting about this statue is that the inscription tells us to stay and pity. We are supposed to engage emotionally with this kind of object because a young man has died, has lost his life in battle. We get elegies written by a Spartan poet called Tertius, songs sung by warriors as they're coming to battle. And one of the things they say is, to a young man all is seemly enough, so long as he have the noble bloom of lovely youth. A marvel he, for men to behold, he is, in Greek, the etos idain, and desirable to women, so long as he ever be alive, and fair and like manner when he be fallen in the vanguard, so let each man bite his lip with his teeth and abide firm set astride upon the ground. So what's interesting here is that it's one of those early instances where you go into battle, men admire you, and women find you desirable even if you die. You leave a good-looking corpse. And so this statue is this kind of mythologised, idealised, prescriptive version of the dead man, uh, designed to instil pity, but also it would inculcate a sense of admiration and a sense of eros, an eroticised gaze on the part of male and female figures as well. That doesn't mean that you start doing things that could get you arrested uh, in public, looking at the statue, but you look at the statue in a very stylized and engaged way. And to get a sense of the, the figure, what the, his barrel chest and his broad shoulders and big beaky thighs would mean, here is a description of somebody who's famously ugly in the Iliad, Thersites. And he's ugly because he was bandy-legged and went lame with one foot, shoulders stooped and drawn together over his chest, and above his skull went up, to his, above this, his skull went up to a point with the wool grown sparsely upon it. This guy's the other, he's got long hair. Okay, the Greeks, they seem to have like bogan haircuts, mild haircuts for a while. I don't know why, but it shows that even they're human after all. As opposed to Thersites, who's bald. Okay, balditude is not a good look. Okay, he's got bandy legs, he's got these shoulders that are stooped, and he's the opposite of what this figure's supposed to be like. So, in reading poetry, you can get a sense of what the sense of the, the ideal figure is going to be. And an example we get from Plato is a figure who's described as a statue because he's so beautiful, this description of this figure called Charmides, who Socrates is ogling him but pretending not to, just pretending to be interested in the young man's soul, not his body. But he's amazed at his beauty and stature, and the whole world seemed to be enamoured of him. Amazement and confusion reigned when he entered, and a troop of lovers followed him. That grown-up men like ourselves should not have been affected in this way is not surprising, but I observed that there was the same feeling among the boys. All of them, down to the very least child, turned and looked at him as if he had been a statue. So when somebody is going to be represented in this way as statuary, it's going to be the sort of thing that will inspire a sense of longing, desire on the part of the, of the, part of the onlooker. It's a very kind of stylized, prescriptive image designed to have a particular effect. We might not think Croesus is all that amazing, but when this would be, would be considered cutting-edge sculpture of its day, marking some advances on previous models of kuroi. Uh, the kuros is just a word for a young male, an aristocratic male, from earlier periods. Now, I'm not saying this is better than these ones, but it's different and it would strike the onlooker as being more vivid. The idea of realism is always going to be a kind of a, a relative concept. And there he is again, <coughs> with his long flying locks and so on, uh, his big buttocks and his big beefy thighs and that sort of thing. And then in a later age, not long afterwards, we get this image of the Critian boy, it's a call. And we have a cast of this image as well. And this may well be a funerary sculpture uh, uh, also. Uh, a young boy, it seems, uh, possibly either a funerary object or maybe to celebrate athletic victory, we're not sure. 
But again, you can see the kind of erotic swivel that he has to his hips as well. Something similar, uh, but taking a different form, is also going on for female figures. Uh, Chori statues, as they're called. And this one is of Fuzzy Clea, her name is. And we have an inscription that can help us uh, understand the image a bit better as well. And it says, the Sama, or the great mark of Fuzzy Clea. I shall always be called Kore, having taken that name from the gods instead of marriage. So for our friend Croesus, his glory is fighting in battle and dying, leaving a good-looking corpse in this very stylized artificial depiction in a way. Her glory in the patriarchal world of archaic Greece would be to bear children and marry, but she dies before that can happen. And that means that she probably died at the age of about 14 or something like that, because women at this period would have been married about the age of 14 or 15 or thereabouts. It's a very aristocratic statue. She's richly uh, tied, as you can see here. There's a reconstruction, and she's holding this lotus flower. Now, what's interesting is she calls herself Kore, which is the name that the poet uses to call Persephone. Remember her earlier in the talk? It goes down to the underworld. And so Kore becomes emblematic of a beautiful young maiden who dies for a while and goes down to the underworld. So in some ways, and this might strike a chord with some of you, I don't know, uh, for women, marriage is seen as a form of death. Uh, a change of life, a change where one part of life comes to an end permanently, but there's some sense of renewal as well. So there's kind of a poignancy in the choice that the, the um, inscription has in deciding to call her Kore, means maiden, but it would also evoke another maiden who went down to the underworld for her marriage. And so she's going to be married to death instead of marrying an actual figure. Here again, it's worth thinking about what she's got in her hand. Uh, this is a, a, a Peplos Kore. She has a, a tulip, but this Peplos Kore he probably would have the same kind of funerary function. She's got uh, either an apple or a pomegranate. And again, it evokes that image of uh, Persephone accepting the pomegranate. And when these female figures are doing this, it could be that they're offering themselves to be married or they've just accepted the offer of marriage with this sense of... Um, uh, the object of the fruit and the seeds that are going to be contained in that as well. I just want to finish up now, thank you for your patience, I'll finish up now in speaking about uh, our friend Sarpedon, again, who is sort of a bit like our friend Croesus. Note the, the mullet haircut, but look at the detail that we're getting here. And this evokes a scene from uh, the Iliad where you have Thanatos, the figure of death, and his brother sleep. Because Zeus, who is the father of Sarpedon, um, gets Apollo, his son, to wash the body uh, on the battlefield and has it taken away by sleep and death and it gets conveyed back to Lycia where it will be the object of cult, cultic worship. So our friend, uh, note the mullet haircut there and we get something similar with this guy as well. So on vast painting we're getting the idea of heroic death, quite a mournful and melancholic scene in many ways it is in the Iliad, but we're getting this sort of image as, as possible compensation. But remember we are asked to pity the man, the sense of sorrow is always going to be there. The idea of heroic death, does it give you complete uh, compensation? Well, uh, who can say? What is interesting is on the other side of this calyx crater, and one thing that interests me as somebody who teaches Greek art is I'm interested in looking at both sides of the, uh, the vases that we're looking at, because often there can be a very interesting interaction between the two images. On one side, we have the death of Sarpedon from the Iliad. On the other side, we have the generic scene of these youthful men who are named, but they're not mythological figures. Probably the kind of guys who would be expected maybe to look to Sarpedon as their model because he fights heroically in battle. And they are getting ready to, uh, they are arming, they are arming themselves in the way that Homeric warriors do, putting on their greaves and so on, they've got their helmets and spears and swords and everything. And they could be seen perhaps as the kind of figures who would be expected to follow the example of someone like Sarpedon. And we know they're going to be rich like Sarpedon because. In the archaic world, you had to provide your own armour, and that was an expensive business. So this kind of vessel would have been used in what's called a sympotic setting, like a, uh, an aristocratic drinking party setting, and it would have been quite possibly the, the sort of topic of conversation. What do we do? We've got a scene from Homeric Epic, and we've got these young men whose names appear there, but they're not figures from myth. Generic young men, perhaps uh, following in the example of Sarpedon, and with the sense of you'd like no place of liege. I want to finish now, just before uh, I'll take some questions if you're interested in asking any, uh, but I just want to finish now uh, by leading you into what we have, one of a splendid body crater from Apulia in southern Italy, which uh, is a grave marker, or probably would have been found in the tomb, of a young aristocratic warrior. 
We can see this guy here in something called the Naiskos or a shrine. And we can see that he's got a horse in the background, which is a sign of wealth. People around him are making offerings. And on the, the backside, as it were, or the, uh, the reverse of the um, body crater, we have his own tomb, if you like, or a, a, a stele, uh, with people around on either side making offerings to it. Now, what's interesting about this figure, plenty of things, it's a, it's a splendid piece. What is interesting, I find, is that you can see this figure, even though he's, okay, the bottom half of him is gone, it's about to happen to a guy after 2,300 years. You can see that he's uh, muscled, he's wearing a, um, a body armour, with his muscul musculature visible underneath. He's got the long flowing hair, like a, a Homeric hero. He's inside a tomb. He's being idealised. He's being memorialised. He is being almost deified in a way. And what is also interesting is... Here, this figure is an eros. This is a figure of desire. So we're getting, if you like, as we had with, say, the figure of Croesus, that statue, uh, kind of a concept of heroic death that is eroticised, perhaps something similar going on here as well. Because we need to ask, is what, what is an eros, an image of desire, doing on a funerary monument to a young man who's probably died in battle? And it could be because it is all part of the process of memorialising the young man. Now, think of figures like James Dean or Rudolf Valentino or Amy Winehouse, figures who die young, but their post-mortem cult sets them up as icons, icons to be emulated and admired and loved and worshipped and everything else. And some people sort of have spoken about the kind of a worldwide necrophilia that took place after Rudolf Valentino died. There was a song called There's a New Star in Heaven Tonight and all this sort of thing. Dying young and leaving a good-looking corpse or a mythologised good-looking corpse can increase the erotic grip you can have on the popular imagination. There may be something similar going on here with this figure as well. This Eros is there, what's it doing over the tomb of this young warrior who's died, he's aristocratic, we know this, with his horse and his helmet and everything else, and this is a large and spectacular piece that is worthy of contemplation uh, with your own eyes. And so on that note, I'll, uh, I'll draw things to a halt and thank you for your patience, and I hope it stimulated you to go into the Tisa Museum and have a look at some of our wonderful exhibits as part of this great exhibition. Thank you. <laughs> if you're all keen to escape, I don't blame you, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to stay back and, and, uh, and answer them. Yeah. I need a bag, so I'll go first. Okay. Um, but I have a homogenous at all. The point I was making was that there's a range of attitudes to death and to heroism. And even within the Iliad, you're getting conflicting views about what it means to be a hero as well. Because, you know, uh, Hector makes his speech to Andromache about my Kletos. I've got to fight for my Kletos, my father's Kletos. And then he, at the end of their talk, he says, now you go home, darling, because war is a man's business. But she's made a very good case of that. No, it isn't just a man's business. There are women and children involved as well. And I think Homer wants to bring that out. Exactly. Uh, Achilles renounces Kleos, as, as I said in Book 9, but then he goes back and he avenges his friend, but he still doesn't achieve closure and peace. That doesn't really happen until he has his moment of crying. Um, and there's a whole strand of philosophical engagement with Homer as well on, on various critical levels. So, uh, no, I'm not saying it's hom homogeneous at all. I'm saying that there are a number of different strands, but there are some strands that are quite influential, and Homer certainly is going to be influential. I mean, even if people are arguing against Homer, uh, that's a very big part of it too. So there are all kinds of responses to death. I mean, this is the, the point I'm making, and that it's um, there was no uh, sole orthodox view. That said, though, there's some views that were reasonably influential, but it's always Greek culture. One of the great things about it is it always seems to be in dialogue with itself on so many levels. Yeah. What's the reincarnation thing? Mm -hmm. So someone decides that they're going to be a dog. 14 years later, the dog died. Do they keep the same privilege of choosing to be in this life? We don't know, uh, in a nutshell. Uh, a lot of this stuff is, is incomplete. We get these, what we often get is these anecdotes. So we get an anecdote 
from Xenophanes, who was a, a philosopher of the 6th century BC, and quite a critic of Homer in many ways, uh, even though he still works under the spell of Homer. Uh, he just tells this story about Pythagoras, and he seems to think it's rather silly. But uh, Pythagoreans, uh, there's evidence that they certainly believed in reincarnation. Uh, and some of their followers, that's one of the reasons why they were vegetarian. They don't eat meat because you might be eating something in one of your relatives, which would be the worst beans. thing you could possibly do. Pardon? Don't eat beans. Don't eat beans. Well, that's right. This is, this is shun beans. It's one of the things that they also said as well. That's right. Um, but Empedocles and the others also said, don't eat meat because you might, you might be eating one of your relatives. So, and all these sort of ritual uh, abstinences which they used to engage in as well. And this all, yeah, this all ties into what they think is going to happen to them after they die, you know. And uh, it's one of a number of strands that we're getting in, uh, you know, in Greek attitudes to, to death and, and what happens. Yeah? Um, do the brothers of Antigone go to the same place in the afterworld? Uh, they have a fair bit to talk about if they did. Um, probably they're expected to, in a way. Um, the reason why I say that is, in the Oedipus Tyrannus, when Oedipus has discovered that he's killed his father and married his mum, sorry, spoiler alert there, but there he is. <laughs> the and he comes and he's blinded himself, and, and the chorus say rather helpfully, why didn't you kill yourself? And he said, because how could I go down to the underworld and bear to look at my mother and father? How could I do that? And he even says, I mean, it's a wonderful moment, but he just says, I wish I could have done something to stop me from hearing things. I just want to destroy, you know, every, all my sensual, uh, sensory organs, if you like, but I can't, you know, bring myself to kill myself. Not through cowardice. He actually says later on, uh, only I'm strong enough to, to endure this, and he doesn't let it destroy him. Um, but probably, though, I would say yes, because when you read the Seven Against Thieves, especially when you read it in Greek, and I really recommend that you do, the brothers are not distinguished at all. At the end, you get this long threnody, a long dirge for the death of the brothers, and they're not separated at all. And you get these particular linguistic forms that known as duels, which unite the two brothers very, very closely. And that's part of the tragedy, is that this never should have happened. It's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong anymore. It's just two brothers have killed each other, and nothing can, can justify that. It never should have got to this point. So in answer to your question, probably in their cultural imagination, yes. And I think morally, by the end of the play, although Antiochus, for the most part, seems the defender, the heroic defender, and nothing justifies killing your own, uh, shedding your own blood. That's sort of one of the ideas that you're getting there. I'm yeah. going to just suggest is because we're on a bit of a time crunch mm -hmm. this evening, yeah. um, how about for those of you that would like to go through to the museum or take five, you're most welcome to. And for those of you that would like to sit here and have further discussion, because we have two spaces, we can do yeah. both yeah. things at once, yeah. and things we can accommodate both of those activities. Yeah. So. I'm happy to do that. If people have further questions, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Okay.